Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Irene Cortez case. An unfortunate accident or a contracted murder of a mother of many. They say a scorned woman is capable of unpredictable and desperate acts, with cold and cruel revenge being the most fearsome. But what about a scorned man? Many would say an offended man might resort to physical violence, drown his sorrows in alcohol, or combine these two scenarios. Yet men, generally less grudge-holding, can be more ingenious when it comes to revenge. The case of Irene Cortez, a Spanish citizen who met a mysterious end during a trip to Colombia, is complex and ambiguous. While her perpetrators were caught, convicted, and are currently serving long sentences, the deceased woman's family claims the real culprit remains at large and is portraying himself as a victim. Let's delve into this intricate story from the beginning and try to determine if a third party was involved, or if the murder was, indeed, unintentional. It's worth noting that each party involved is still trying to prove their version of the truth. Who was Irene Cortez? Irene Cortez, born Lucas, was born in 1980 in sunny Granada, Spain, the capital of the province of the same name. She grew up in a well-off family with a brother and sister. Her parents ran a small but profitable business. According to some reports, her father passed away early, but her mother, Maria Lucas, took over the business operations, expanded the enterprise, and ensured her children lacked for nothing. Maria's older brother, Uncle Pedro Lucas, was also a significant help. Irene was the eldest of the three children. A beautiful and sociable girl, she loved being the center of attention and attracted boys from an early age. Shortly after finishing school, she married and was already pregnant. At 17, she became a mother for the first time, and two years later, she had her second child. Her mother and uncle provided considerable support, allowing her to pursue a good education despite early motherhood. In the early 2000s, Irene moved to the resort city of Malaga with her husband and two children. There, she opened an entertainment venue that quickly became popular and profitable. Initially a small disco bar, it eventually transformed into a full-fledged nightclub. In Malaga, the couple welcomed their third child, and life seemed prosperous and stable. At 25, Irene's husband was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison for trafficking illegal substances. Tragically, he lost his life in prison under mysterious circumstances. The responsibility of raising the children fell solely on Irene's shoulders. Remembering how her mother single-handedly raised three children, Irene was determined to persevere. She successfully managed her business, earned well, and had big plans for the future. Relationship with Farid Henesaris Farid Henesaris, a native of Barranquilla, Colombia, was born in 1976. Growing up in a large, impoverished family, he was the youngest of his siblings. His parents separated in the early 90s when he was still a teenager. His older siblings were independent by then, and Farid stayed with his mother. In 2001, at 25, Farid, along with his elderly mother, moved to Spain in search of a better life. They settled in Malaga, where Farid took any job he could to support himself and his mother. In 2005, he started working as a waiter at a nightclub owned by Irene. Irene immediately noticed Farid's hard work and reliability. She was also attracted to him, and Farid in turn did his best to please her. At the time, Irene's husband was incarcerated, and she planned to file for divorce but couldn't before her husband's untimely demise. Irene and Farid's employer-employee relationship soon blossomed into romance. Farid wasn't deterred by Irene's three children from previous relationships, nor was Irene bothered by Farid's humble background as a waiter whose salary she paid. Within months of starting their relationship, the couple decided to move in together. They settled in Irene's spacious apartment, and soon after, Irene became pregnant with Farid's child. They went on to have two children together. It's unclear if they were officially married, but Irene kept her first husband's surname, while the children born with Farid carried the Henesaris surname. Imprisonment and Infidelity In 2009, Irene's past seemed to repeat itself. Like her first husband, Farid was arrested for distributing illegal substances and sent to prison. Once again, Irene was left alone, this time with five children. Farid was sentenced to three years, but served only one and a half, being released early for good behavior and cooperation with the investigation. 
However, soon after Farid's imprisonment, Irina found solace in the arms of another man and lived with him for those one and a half years. Farid learned of her infidelity only after his release. Understandably furious, he threatened Irene and her lover and almost attacked the man, narrowly avoiding another legal issue. Eventually, they resolved the matter peacefully. Farid forgave Irene for the sake of their children, and they resumed living together as if there had been no imprisonment or infidelity. Irene's relatives were always skeptical about Farid. Her mother and uncle disapproved of their relationship, suspecting Farid was only interested in Irene's money. Also, Irene's older children from her first marriage never accepted Farid, while the youngest, whom Farid had raised since the child was two, saw him as a father figure. Fateful Trip to Colombia In early 2011, Irene's husband, Farid, expressed the need to visit his homeland of Colombia due to his father's severe illness. Reportedly, Farid's estranged father was diagnosed with advanced cancer, and his sister in Barranquilla had informed him of the dire situation. Irene, who had long wished to visit Farid's homeland, decided to accompany him. She was eager to meet Farid's father, whom she had never met, and also experienced the legendary Barranquilla Carnival, typically held in late February. Moreover, Iran, who hadn't taken a vacation for years due to her dedication to work and raising her five children, saw this trip as an opportunity for a much-needed break. The couple planned a 10-day trip across the ocean, with Irene's mother and younger sister agreeing to care for her children during this period. Despite her mother, Maria Lucas's attempts to dissuade her from the journey due to a bad premonition, Irene disregarded her concerns. At the same time, the family faced financial difficulties due to a seasonal downturn in their business. Despite this, Irene had personal savings of 3,000 euros in cash hidden at home. But on the eve of their trip, she discovered the money had mysteriously vanished, almost derailing their plans. Irene quickly borrowed the necessary funds from her uncle and close friends. She also booked their flight tickets and a hotel in the city center, thoroughly preparing for a journey that, tragically, would be her last. Mysterious Murder On February 27, 2011, the couple arrived in Colombia. The flight was uneventful, and they immediately checked into their hotel. Irene called home to reassure her mother. However, two days later, Farid informed Irene's eldest son, 14, of his mother's death. Initially, Farid claimed an accident, but it was soon revealed that Irene was murdered during a robbery at a Barranquilla entertainment venue. The case quickly became a major news story in Colombia. The narrative was that Irene, a Spanish tourist, was killed by robbers who fled the scene, triggering a citywide police manhunt. However, the circumstances of the robbery and murder seemed unusual and suspicious. The attackers did not appear to be trying to steal anything, but instead shot Irene in the heart and then fled in haste. Police and local media representatives quickly arrived on the scene. Despite the fact that Farid witnessed the shooting of his partner during an interview with journalists, he looked quite calm, not corresponding to the image of a grief-stricken widower. The Spanish embassy in Bogota confirmed the murder, adding that Irene's remains will be repatriated after the necessary investigations. The exact events of the night of March 2nd have yet to be clarified by investigators. In the meantime, authorities are actively pursuing the attackers responsible for this senseless crime. Surveillance footage. The case of Irene Cortez's mysterious death seemed to gain clarity after reviewing surveillance footage from cameras installed at the location where the murder occurred. On March 1st, Irene and her partner, Farid Genesaris, had planned to meet Farid's brother, his sister, and their spouses. The group of six enjoyed the carnival, walked around town, and then, at Farid's suggestion, went to a local bar for dinner and entertainment. By 1 a.m., Irene, Farid, and his relatives were the only customers at the bar, as surveillance footage clearly shows. Around 2 a.m., two young men sitting away from the group entered the bar. They did not order anything and did not look comfortable, which caught the attention of the bar manager because of their suspicious behavior. Moreover, their young appearance made the manager check whether they were of legal age. The young men refused to show their IDs and, when asked to leave, one of them pulled out a gun 
and aimed it at the manager. His accomplice produced a knife, but soon retreated out of the camera's view. The armed assailant pushed the manager aside and approached Irene's table, announcing a robbery and demanding mobile phones and cash. His knife-wielding partner reappeared, presumably to collect valuables while the gunman kept the group under threat. However, he didn't get a chance to act. Confronting Irene, the gunman ordered Farid to stand for a pocket search. As Irene reached for her purse, the assailant lunged at her with the same hand holding the gun. A shot was fired as he grabbed the purse, striking Irene directly in the chest. She collapsed to the floor as the assailants fled without taking anything. Farid and his brother chased after them while his sister tried to stop Irene's bleeding and his brother's wife called for emergency services. Unfortunately, the culprits were too fast to catch. The men returned to the bar, attempting to aid Irene, but it was too late. Emergency responders arrived quickly, yet Irene succumbed to her injuries en route to the hospital, leaving behind a baffling case and a grieving family. The Hunt for the Perpetrators, Arrest and Trial In the wake of the robbery and homicide that took Irene Cortez's life, law enforcement mobilized all available resources. The city was teeming with tourists for the carnival, and ensuring their safety was paramount. A reward of 10 million pesos, about 3,500 euros, was announced for information leading to the culprits. The first suspect, the gunman Brian Dario, was apprehended the next day. He quickly implicated his accomplice, Juan Carlos. Juan, 18, surrendered to authorities, hoping for leniency. During interrogation, Dario claimed dire financial straits, debts, and a sick child in need of costly treatment drove him to the crime corroborated later by his relatives. He maintained that Irene's shooting was accidental, occurring while trying to snatch her purse. Juan Carlos contended he was an unwitting participant. He said Brian didn't reveal his plans but asked for backup in a job. He claimed to have only a small knife for intimidation, not harm, and left the scene once he realized Brian's intentions. However, surveillance footage contradicted his claims, showing him returning to Brian. With both perpetrators in custody and their confessions, the case appeared solved, with prison sentences looming. The court found Dario guilty of robbery and homicide under aggravating circumstances, sentencing him to 23 years. Carlos received 17 years for complicity in these crimes. Accusations against Farid and new crime details. From the early stages of the investigation, the family of the deceased woman openly accused Farid of orchestrating the murder of his wife. Irene's mother and uncle hired a detective who conducted an independent investigation, gathering additional materials and evidence to hold the man accountable and prove his involvement in the crime. Starting with the earlier mentioned disappearance of 3,000 euros from the hiding place in Cortez's house. According to Maria Lucas, only Farid knew about this money and he was the only one who could have discreetly taken it. The woman told her daughter about this from the beginning, but she did not want to listen. Now, she believed that her son-in-law used this money to pay Dario to kill his wife. Another weighty argument was the fabricated illness of the man's father, whom he was so eager to visit. It turned out that no cancer diagnosis was made for the elderly parent, and he was quite healthy for his age. Farid concocted this story, making it the main pretext for the trip to Colombia. Also, it was Genesaris who initiated the visit to that fateful establishment. Moreover, he insisted on continuing the feast deep into the night when all the other visitors had long dispersed, and their company was alone in the hall. Further, the detective conducted a detailed analysis of those very recordings from the cameras, giving an assessment of what was happening and making his own conclusions. He noticed that the criminals acted strangely. Juan was clearly scared and, most likely, really did not understand what was happening while Brian approached the company, came up to Farid and raised him, but did not directly threaten him with a gun. It looked like the men knew each other and acted cohesively. Then Farid, strangely, moved behind Irene, who was sitting at the table. When she reached into her bag to get her wallet, the criminal with the gun looked at the man as if waiting for a signal. It's hard to say exactly whether he received any kind of sign, as the victim and her husband were back to the camera. After the shot, the man chased the killer, but, in the expert's opinion, he deliberately let him escape. 
However, the latter statement can be considered controversial, as Brian was armed with a gun and Fareed could reasonably fear for his life. Also in question was the man's behavior after his chosen one was declared dead. He willingly gave interviews to the arrived correspondents, talked about the details of what happened, and, at the same time, did not look too upset or depressed. Another important question. Why, after the tragedy, did Genesaris call not Irene's mother, not her uncle, or any of the adult relatives, but dialed the number of her 14-year-old son to tell him about his mother's death? According to Maria Lucas, he wanted to personally inflict pain on the teenager, punishing him for not recognizing the stepfather's authority and treating him disrespectfully. The woman's uncle was the first to dare to give an interview in the press and openly talk about his suspicions and the results of the investigation. Pedro Lucas was sure that Farid planned the trip in advance, essentially luring Irene into a trap. The money stolen from her was used to pay for the services of a hired killer, and after her death, he planned to establish guardianship over the children and take over the business of his deceased wife. Farid's mother did not silently listen to her son being accused of a terrible crime and openly stood up for her offspring. The woman claimed that her offspring was madly in love with Irene and her children and would never harm her. However, in the end, the parent inadvertently let slip a phrase about the chosen one not having to cheat on Farid, as this greatly offended his pride. Also, an unpleasant detail emerged about Genesaris leaving Spain on fake documents, as he was not allowed to leave the country because he had recently been released from prison on parole. The man himself denied this information, stating that he left legally and Irene acted as his guarantor. Funeral Without the Widower Twelve days after the tragedy, Irene's body was returned to her native Spain. The funeral was conducted with a closed casket, as the remains had begun to decompose after such an extended period. Hundreds attended the funeral, family, friends, neighbors, and even those who didn't personally know Cortés, but had heard about the resonant story and wanted to express their condolences to the family. The only person missing from the farewell ceremony was Varid, who simply feared returning from Colombia, apprehensive of retribution. Farid claimed that the relatives of his late wife had repeatedly threatened him and his elderly mother. For this reason, before flying back to Spain, he intended to appeal to the authorities to ensure his safety. He sought a protective order to be able to attend the funeral, but his request was denied, and Genesaris decided not to take the risk. In turn, Farid filed a complaint in court against the relatives of his deceased wife, who, he alleged, hindered his return home. However, Maria and Pedro Lucas denied his claims, stating they were most interested in his return to face trial in Spain. Additional Court Proceedings With new circumstances and accusations against Farid, an additional investigation and court proceedings were conducted. Dario and Carlos, already serving their sentences in a Colombian prison, were interrogated about their acquaintance with Genesaris and a possible premeditated conspiracy. However, Brian categorically denied this assumption. He continued to insist that the murder was an accidental result of a failed robbery attempt. He claimed he had never seen Farid before, let alone been hired as a hitman for his wife. The accusations indeed seemed to be grasping at straws, with no irrefutable evidence of premeditation or a contract killing, only assumptions and interpretations of the events on the recording. Dario also confessed that he was under the influence of alcohol and prohibited substances that evening, hence his poor recollection of the event's chronology. As for Carlos, he maintained that his friend did not involve him in his plans, and everything that happened in the bar was as shocking to him as it was to those they attacked. Juan appeared to be telling the truth, but Brian's words, who made the fatal shot, raised some doubts. Consider this. He failed to commit the robbery, ended up in prison, but his sick child still received the necessary expensive treatment. Brian claimed that kind-hearted people learning about his motive helped him. However, the Lucas family's lawyers tried to prove that the 3,000 euros stolen from Irene, which Farid paid for her murder, were spent on the treatment. Supposedly, Brian agreed to sacrifice himself and go to prison to save his child and secretly pass the money to his wife. 
This version, however, was never proven, returned to Spain. Only after obtaining a court order that guaranteed his safety did Genesaris decide to return to Spain. Several months had passed since the tragedy, and the media frenzy had subsided. Upon his return, Genesaris claimed to have brought investigation materials proving his innocence in his wife's murder. He cited his main reason for returning as a desire to care for the children he shared with Irene, who had been under the care of the deceased's relatives during his absence. Six months later, Farid decided to give a major interview, in which he revealed that he had lost virtually everything. He was jobless, his passport had been annulled, preventing him from leaving the country, and to add insult to injury, his friends had turned their backs on him, and the mother and uncle of his late wife forbade him from seeing his children. Genesaris repeatedly faced Maria and Pedro Lucas in court. He accused them of threatening him while they attempted to prove his involvement in Irene's murder. However, neither side could substantiate their claims. Ultimately, the children remained in the custody of their grandmother and uncle, and the widower was unable to claim any of his late wife's property. Thanks for watching, guys. Do you think Farid is guilty in the death of his wife? Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to press the bell, not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.